this webinar on clean energy innovation in Africa. This webinar has been organized by the Energy Regulators Association of East Africa, ERA, which brings together the national regulatory institutions of the East Africa community countries intending to promote a robust energy union. My name is Leah Hadija Jara, moderator of this forum. I represent the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority in ERA's Legal Portfolio Committee. It is an honor and a delight to be here with you all. This webinar brings together leading experts in the continent to discuss the strategies for accelerating renewable energy, strategic innovations for renewable energy, and the role of clean energy and renewable energy in post-COVID-19 economic recovery in Africa. We want to look at the opportunities and the challenges and really the way forward. We are streaming live to many who are not in this platform and further, the webinar shall be recorded live. The order of the session is as follows. We are going to have a keynote speech from Dr. Rabia Ferruki, who is a director of knowledge policy and finance center at the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. We shall then have substantive presentations from our list of eminent panelists. We are honored to have on our panel the following, the Acting Director for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency African Development Bank, Dr. John Daniel Schroth, the Chairperson um, Area General Assembly, Honorable Gathan Nikayenzi, and the Chief um, Executive Officer, EEED, advisory engineer Murefu Barasa and Dr. Nalule, who will be joining us all the way from Uganda. And finally, we shall have a Q&A session. We therefore request our distinguished participants to channel the questions to the platform chat, addressing the particular panelists for response. And indeed, we are going to have an extremely rich perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you and welcome Dr. Rabia Ferruki to give her keynote speech. Just to give you a bio about her, Dr. Rabia joined IRENA in 2011. She is currently the Director of Knowledge, Policy and Finance at the Center of International Renewable Energy Agency, where she oversees the agency's work on knowledge, policy and finance, including efforts to produce up-to-date and authoritative renewable energy data and information, analysis to identify best practice in renewable energy policies and finance, and advice and support to countries tailoring policy and investment analysis to renewables uh, deployment in the field. Dr. Ferruki brought to this position over 25 years of experience in the fields of energy development and environment. She worked in both public and private sectors, including um, the energy companies and governments globally, international institutions and research centers. Dr. Ferruki holds a master's in applied economics and a PhD in economics from the American University in Washington, DAC. Welcome again and over to you, Dr. Rabia Ferruki. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hadida. I really need to shorten this. It's far too long talking about a person. So thank you very much again for, uh, for the invitation and the possibility to provide uh, some insights uh, in this uh, pre brief uh, uh, time that we have allocated. Um, and, and the way I'm going to divide it is first to show the benefits of an energy transition, uh, including for our continent, um, Africa, but then also go dive quickly into the power sector and some of the power, uh, power market um, uh, uh, challenges that the energy and transition can bring with it and how to basically uh, find solution, whether you're talking about liberalized or, um, or not liberalized markets. So I'm really happy to be here today and just uh, basically set the scene. Um, I, I think we're coming at the, this comes at the right moment because the COVID pandemic has definitely shown the limitations of our current energy system. And uh, we know now that uh, the energy transi the transition is basically unavoidable. Now, how to best maximize benefits 
and address those potential misalignments that come with any structural change is what we are trying to address in ARENA for a few years now. So there is definitely uh, also this moment that we are living is really a moment to, to uh, an, or, or rather an opportunity to make sure that we invest in this climate uh, safe future, but we really need to uh, align the, these short-term investments and policies in particular for recovery with those long, longer term needs that we have of de decarbonizing our economies so that we can attract uh, 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 additional investments uh, in the in the sectors in the sector. Sorry. Uh, so next, um, as you know, Arena has uh, 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 its energy pathways. Uh, that's the transforming energy pathways, which uh, proposes a very ambitious pa uh, pathway to the energy transition from to 2030 and then to 2050. And that reflects the goals of the 2015 Paris Agreement and examines its impact. Um, and, and it shows that uh, annual uh, energy related CO2 emissions would really need to decline by 70% below today's level by 2050. And renewables would really uh, represent an increasing share of uh, uh, which would increase to 28% from about 14 today to 65% work to be done to, to achieve these goals. And while uh, the report is, is, is um, it, it provides estimates of a transition pathway that we did last year, we will uh, provide a new pathway that is uh, 1.5 degree compatible in the next uh, couple of months. Um, so, uh, going rather than going to 2050, which seems such a long way uh, from now, I will just focus a little bit on 2030, where, uh, next slide please, total investments in the energy related transition related technologies. Can we go to next slide please? Sorry, thanks. So total investments in energy transition related technologies, and those are renewable energy efficiency, grid infrastructure, energy efficiency, electrification of end use sectors would amount to about 4.5 trillion per year from uh, now until 2030. So about a cumulative of 50 trillion, let's say, where in our pathway about 10% would be uh, for, for, the, Af for Af the African continent. Uh, I just want to show that uh, we have all the details, of course, about the, diff the different energy sources and, and their evolution and all the solutions, technology solutions, policy recommendations to accompany this energy transition. But I just want to briefly show that in the next slide, please, the, uh, the, the, this pathway would bring enormous socioeconomic benefits uh, uh, globally. So we have um, overall the energy sec sector would have an additional 15 million people being employed uh, in addition, uh, meaning to the planned uh, trajectory for, for the moment. Uh, that would be the case by 2030. And interestingly enough, job, it, in our estimates look, show that job losses in fossil fuels are more than offset by the job creation in the deployment of clean uh, or uh, renew, um, energy transition related technologies. Um, GDP would also increase by uh, an additional 1.3% per year. And more importantly, welfare globally would be at 7% above what would uh, be the case under a plan traject the plan trajectory currently. And what is interesting, and you can see that on the graph, is that all regions tend to uh, stand to gain from this transition, with, of course, some faring much better than others, depending on country conditions, resources, uh, 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 means of ambition, and uh, uh, ambition, and of course, what I, I started with, which are the, the, the current existing conditions. And I, I think what is interesting to note, though, is that uh, the fact that for each million dollar invested in renewables or energy flexibility, we would get 25 jobs and for energy efficiency, about 10 jobs. This is approximately three times more than the job intensity for fossil fuels. Next one, please. 
I'll go very quickly around that. We have divided, and for, we do have more granular data that is coming up for Africa in a report that we are, we will be publishing in the summer, uh, which looks at the five subcontinent, uh, sub sub region of, of the of our continent. Uh, but but just to briefly show you here, we have a divide between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. In North Africa, you can see that that there is a net gain in terms of job, a slight increase, additional uh, boost to GDP, uh, driven mainly by by investment and trade gains. Um, and then, uh, of course, the welfare improvement that that comes usually from from health uh, health uh, improvement. If you ne go next slide is on, on Sub-Saharan Africa, it's it's uh, again the similar uh, pattern in terms of gaining jobs overall, uh, um, a, a slight additional boost in GDP, welfare, etc. And um, uh, the, 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 I'd just like to point one, one aspect that we look at a lot over the past few years, which is a lot of these gains can come, can be generated along the values of the supply chain for renewable energy. Uh, and we look really at each segment of the value chain to see how local value can be created and, and, and bring, brought uh, domestically. So I will not stay too long on this because this is not the main topic, but I just wanted to, to, to bring up to to showcase the, the 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 benefits that the energy transition can bring, especially if we are uh, we, we have the, the the right environment in terms of policy and regulation uh, 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 to to accompany it. So now, obviously, uh, it, it is a good moment, and we do need in this a slow economic downturn, to, uh, the current economic downturn, to to make sure that we can uh, take advantage of. Uh, of, of investing in the right uh, assets, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, but of course we also know that the energy transition brings with it uh, some challenges. So I just focus on the power sector, even though we have uh, all the sectors that we study. Um, so some of the challenges will will apply to the uh, regulation of the power system, which which were written in the fossil fuel era. Um, and, and that makes it harder for renewable energy power, power plants to be uh, integrated. So the nature of uh, renewable energy, obviously, as you all know, differs from fossil fuels. It's more capital intensive, it's distributed, it requires higher system flexibility and social involvement. So uh, this is why power system rules very often are not ready to integrate renewables. Uh, these are misalignments between regulation and, and the needs for, of, of renewable energy are common around, among all power systems, wh whether they're regulated or liberalized. And I think this is a very important point because the first uh, policy, let's say, um, advised by some is that you should uh, basically liberalize and it will resolve your pro the, the problem. Not true. So. Uh, uh, policymakers and regulators are, are asked really to act now to adjust the power system and make it ready for higher shares of, of renewable energy. And this is why it needs to be planned the, uh, through a planned restructuring that avoids uh, falling in, in some of the pitfalls of what, what is sometimes taking place, which are small fixes. Um, uh, as, as the power system transitions. So one uh, example of such pitfalls is what, we, what is called the, the, the missing money problem, uh, typical of liberalized marginal, marginal uh, price systems. Uh, low marginal cost uh, variable renewable energy generators displace conventional generators with higher fuel costs. And, and as a result of that, they reduce the, the, the volume the, the, that they sell. In addition, increased renewable energy generation decreases the wholesale market prices and causes conventional thermal generators to suffer from reduced electricity prices. So the first generators to suffer in this situation are typically gas-fired power plants, which uh, provide the current bolt of the system of the system flexibility in many in many uh, power uh, uh, mar uh, markets or systems. So fossil fuel generators will be gradually decommissioned as the power system is transformed to address climate constraints. 
but retirement of the most flexible fossil fuel generators could, should not outpace the deployment of other sources of flexibility that are fit actually for a renewable-based energy system, since the, the flexibility and reliability must be assured at all times. Now, next slide, please. Going uh, uh, fix by fix as a result can only cause additional barriers, uh, so, such as the, the one I just mentioned uh, uh, and can, the cannibalization effect and the, what is called the grid debt spiral, uh, uh, spiral sorry, which will create a power system that can really uh, provide a, a further hamper the energy transition. So this is why we insist on the idea of preparing the power system of the future now uh, that, that, that would be able to work with capital intensive and, and distributed energy in order to ensure the, the, the success. Um, on the African continent, where most of the power system is, is regulated and not liberalized, as I mentioned earlier, this will also mean carefully considering whether liberalization is really needed. Um, just as was seen uh, earlier, the marginal pricing does not work uh, necessarily well with renewable energy. So ARENA has proposed a, a solution that can work both for regulated and liberalized system that somehow transcends that uh, 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 sort of uh, dichotomy that we've had for, for, for quite a while. And, and we have called that the dual procurement. Um, so the, the, the fundamental characteristics uh, of, renew, the, of the, the, the renewable electricity generators uh, and flexible resources are significantly different. So short-term marginal pricing may, may at some point be unable to gu guarantee the cost recovery uh, to a variable renewable energy plants uh, as their penetration increases and therefore depressing prices. But rewarding flexible resources with high fuel costs or opportunity costs with a stable long-term payment is not economically efficient. So the dual procurement approach uh, acknowledges the, the different characteristics of the technologies needed for a renewables-based energy system. And, and this is why it splits the procurement in two differentiated, but at the same time coordinated structures, a, a long-term energy procurement mechanism and a short-term flexibility procurement mechanism, where the first would procure energy via auctions or, or, or long-term procurement mechanisms, uh, there, this, will be, this will need to be uh, crafted in a way to procure the energy needed for future, for the future, for, sorry, for the future. And then the second procurement mechanism would be open to all participants, uh, demand side included, uh, that would be able to exchange energy on a short term uh, or short time notice uh, to keep the system uh, stable. So, so the, this is just a few insights. Uh, we have a, a lot more on that, of course, that explains it all. But um, a, 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 holistic, a holistic vision and, and, and sort of integrated deployment will be needed uh, for these two procurement mechanisms to, to properly complement each other. So Irina has sketched a proposal um, of what I just mentioned now in its publication last year called Power System Organizational Structure for the Renewable Energy Era. And we are currently finalizing a more detailed analysis based on a lot of uh, uh, discussions and, 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 and case studies uh, with different uh, stakeholders in the power sector, Mark, uh, um, involved in the power sector. Uh, and this is forthcoming in a few months that can really support uh, the debate around the uh, uh, market design and the restructuring of power system, systems. Sorry. So again, thank you very much. And I'm uh, uh, terribly sorry that I have to leave, but uh, the person leading the work in my, in my division is uh, Mr. Emanuele Bianco, who is uh, with you and will be uh, uh, more than happy uh, to answer the questions on th that you may have on that. And I wish you a very, very nice uh, event. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hadida.
Thank you so very much. What an honor to have you on board and give us your perspective. We're very grateful. Um, to all the participants, uh, we or on their behalf, we do say thank you again. If you do have any questions addressed to Dr. Rabia, kindly do channel them on the chat functionality. Um, we will have um, somebody respond to the questions at the Q&A session. So what an honor to have you, Dr. Rabia, and um, thank you. Um, thank you very much. So the contest has been laid. We've learned about the, um, is it dynamics on a global space? Um, and we are we're able to be guided as we welcome our eminent panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome to the floor our first panelist, Dr. Daniel Scroth. He is the Acting Director for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency at the African Development Bank. Just to give you a short bio of him, Dr. Daniel Alexander Scroth is the Acting Director for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency and the Advisor to the Vice President for Power, Energy, Climate and Green Growth at the African Development Bank. In his capacity, he oversees the bank's lending and non-lending activities in the renewable energy and energy efficiency space, including the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa, CEFA, and the Desert to Power Initiative. He was previously the coordinator of the Sustainable Energy for All Africa Hub, hosted by the AFTB in partnership with the AU, NEPAD, and UNDP. Daniel also coordinated the Africa Climate Technology and Finance Center project, the Green Mini Grid Market Development Program, and the bank's involvement in the EU Africa Infrastructure Trust Fund. Daniel has extensive experience in energy policy and renewable energy. Prior to joining the AFDB, he worked for several years for the European Commission in both headquarters and in the field for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and in the private sector. Daniel serves in several steering and oversight committees. Daniel holds a PhD and a master's in international relations with focus on international energy policy from the University of Cambridge and business degrees from Reims Management School and the European School of Business. Welcome and over to you, Daniel Scroth. Thank you very much for that um, introduction and um, good afternoon, uh, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, it's a pleasure being part of this um, uh, session and um, it's also great to come in after the excellent presentation from Ravia, who's really set um, uh, the context and went already into a lot of detail um, on uh, the um, renewable energy context in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I have prepared a presentation. I will try to be um, time efficient. Um, let me just to put that on the on the screen. I hope you can see uh, the slide. Okay. Um, obviously, just uh, I think the context um, is is very clear, and um, I think everyone uh, connected is very well aware. But I always find this slide um, uh, extremely powerful um, to highlight that Africa is obviously um, the continent facing the, um, the most significant challenge on the energy access front. Um, and that has, of course, um, many um, um, important consequences. Um, uh, we have businesses, industries, um, in many cases, still running on very inefficient diesel gensets. Um, was recently a very interesting study done on Nigeria alone. Um, uh, enormous potential to replace um, uh, diesel uh, with clean um, sources. Uh, and of course, this, this, this is uh, given the critical role that energy plays for development at large. Um, this is uh, really posing a significant economic burden both for households, but also importantly for industry, particularly with Africa keen to move um, forward on industrialization and structural transformation. Um, I think also just to recall that um, um, Africa is um, sort of the least contributor globally to climate change uh, as a continent, um, uh, but um, uh, at the same time, Africa is particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Uh, so we really have this paradox between 
having contributed to um, uh, the least to climate change, but at the same time being particularly affected. And uh, the slide uh, highlights uh, numerous um, areas um, of um, how the continent um, is affected. And, um, and I think we've seen this over recent years with both floodings, uh, droughts, um, a low custom um, um, uh, uh, swarms um, in, in East Africa, uh, hurricanes and, and, um, and, and other natural phenomena. Um, we also all are extremely aware of the enormous uh, renewable energy potential of the continent. Um, um, obviously, um, those are some, some estimates um, uh, in terms of the, the potential, um, particularly for solar across the continent, hydro, particularly in Central Africa, uh, wind in the coastal regions in, in, in Northern Africa and Southern Africa as well. Uh, we also have, of course, potential for geothermal in, along the East African Rift Valley. Um, so there is enormous potential at the same time as highlighted, um, Africa is still extremely poor in terms of um, energy access. Um, <clears throat> and what is particularly worrying is that um, while the, the numbers um, of people without access to electricity um, decreased over the previous years, um, um, not at the pace required to reach the sustainable development goal number seven of universal access to electricity by 2030, but at least there wasn't this decrease. Um, the COVID-19 crisis has really um, uh, reversed the situation and um, the, I think the uh, Rabia can probably already give some indications in terms of the, the new SDG7 tracking framework that will be coming out shortly. But, um, the indications are that um, in 2020, uh, as a result of the crisis, uh, we have seen an uptake uh, in, in the people without access to electricity. And this is, of course, uh, extremely uh, varying and, and requires concerted efforts of um, governments, but also um, of the various um, um, partners to, uh, to address this. Um, I, I think at the same time, just looking here at figures from the International Energy Agency's World Energy Outlook, I think it's important to highlight that obviously there has been a considerable progress um, over the last decade um, uh, in the African context. Um, uh, and we have seen a significant increase um, of renewable-based um, uh, power generation capacity. Um, uh, um, I think it's a 77% here. Uh, in the slide, um, um, that is that is significant. We see a lot of countries taking um, um, concrete um, steps, um, both in terms of setting the targets, uh, improving the policy regulatory framework, and, and also structuring, um, uh, have a more structured approach to the development of renewables, particularly uh, in the form of uh, procurement programs, auction using the auction model uh, that has seen um, increasing traction across. Um, uh, across the continent in recent years. Um, obviously, renewables are um, diverse. Um, I think there is um, uh, significant developments across the different segments um, in the solar home system segment. Obviously, in East Africa, as you know, it's been very much at the forefront um, of these developments, um, notably uh, enabled by mobile payment systems. Uh, but it's now not uh, any more limited um, uh, regional um, uh, market. It really has expanded uh, across uh, the continent in many new uh, localities and, and, and countries uh, in West Africa, Southern Africa, but also in, in, in Central Africa. Um, there's also the entire CNI segment, commercial industrial, um, where there is um, significant uh, opportunities. Uh, I alluded earlier to um, the uh, opportunity of displacing uh, diesel um, uh, generators. Um, um, and um, uh, that's also an area where more work uh, will need to be done also on the policy and regulatory frameworks, um, allowing um, um, also different stakeholders to provide um, excess electricity into the grids. Um, Mini grids um, have uh, seen a significant uh, evolution over the last years, and um, um, I think there's a lot of excitement uh, around this um, um, uh, approach, uh, in particular with its um, opportunity also to power uh, productive activities uh, in rural areas and contribute to, to local economic development. Uh, and of course, 
um, uh, utility scale um, uh, power plants um, um, uh, where we have seen developments uh, in, in, in many countries, but uh, not at the, at the pace um, uh, required. Um, obviously, I'm not going into this, it, it was clearly highlighted, um, uh, but um, uh, this growth uh, on this, uh, is obviously underpinned by the decreasing costs. Uh, this are actually an arena slide uh, or arena uh, figure, um, um, tremendous cost reductions over the last decade. Um, um, obviously, we still have challenges in particularly the, the Af many African power systems of being able to integrate more variable uh, power generation sources, particularly solar and wind. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, storage is, is a key um, a dimension um, in, in this regard. Um, 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 but also, I would add here the, the importance of um, increased um, regional integration and interconnection of, um, uh, of the various um, networks um, to balance also at a regional level. Um, I think just looking forward, um, uh, importantly, uh, there is a considerable uh, growth projection uh, for renewables uh, for the next decade. Um, so these are figures uh, from, again, from the IEA, um, from the sustainable development scenario. Um, and, um, and it's very clear that um, uh, renewables are really um, uh, setting, setting the pace, seeing by far the highest um, um, growth. Um, um, and um, in particular, solar PV in terms of um, the technologies. Um, uh, I liked the, the terminology that um, uh, the colleagues from IEA used recently in a, in a webinar of um, solar becoming uh, the new king of electricity. Um, and obviously, there is also um, a very strong uh, focus um, on um, everything that comes with uh, the digitalization agenda. Um, and um, uh, as is highlighted here, that those are really uh, working to changing the, the rules of the game. Um, and uh, that there are many, many developments. Uh, I think here that the challenge will really be to, to, to ensure that um, Africa is at the forefront um, of these te technologies. Um, I think in some areas that that is already the case. I, uh, certainly in terms of mobile payments, Africa has been, pay as you go models, Africa has been uh, a front runner. Um, uh, but uh, equally in, in, in other technologies, uh, there, is, there is potential to, in a way, leapfrog to uh, more modern um, uh, power systems. Um, just very quickly to, to highlight, uh, not going into too much detail, but um, uh, despite, um, I think, these positive developments, um, many uh, challenges that we are all aware of uh, continue to slow, in particular, private sector investments in renewable energy. Uh, I think we're still struggling uh, more broadly with um, having um, a sufficient number of well-developed and bankable projects that um, um, so there's a strong continued need um, for project preparation funding. Um, there is also um, a challenge in, in, in some areas um, with access to finance, particularly um, uh, risk capital. Uh, and also being able to provide financing uh, in, in, in local currency, um, given that the exchange rate risk is obviously a, a particular risk that um, needs to be addressed. Um, a lot of focus um, obviously still required on, on the policy and regulatory frameworks. Um, just to highlight that um, um, the African Development Bank uh, has been working closely with uh, the regional regulators and regulatory associations in terms of our flagship uh, electricity regulatory index. Um, the last edition, the 2020 edition, was uh, published uh, last November, really trying to identify um, what are um, uh, the key challenges the regulators um, face um, and what are some of the um, uh, actions that need to be undertaken to improve um, on, on, on that uh, electricity regulatory index. That's an annual exercise, um, uh, really also to benchmark and track progress uh, on the regulatory side. And, and last but certainly not least is um, particularly um, for IPP projects, um, um, the 
ever recurring issue of um, the bankability of the off takers, really the situation of the power utilities, um, which actually has been worsened um, also as, a, as an effect of the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, this is obviously still um, a prevailing challenge. Um, I just uh, want to highlight uh, in a couple of slides um, a bit the, the, the work of the African Development Bank um, in, in, in this context. Uh, we have um, adopted a few years back um, as the first of the so-called high fives of, Afri uh, of, of the African Development Bank, our New Deal Energy for Africa strategy with, a very, with very ambitious targets, both on generation but also in terms of connections. Um, um, we have under this strategy um, uh, several key themes really trying to provide um, uh, holistic support both on the policy side, working with utilities, but also in terms of preparing projects and looking at innovative financing, uh, including um, in the decentralized energy access aspect, but also uh, having a strong focus in terms of um, uh, the regional projects, uh, which is in a little bit uh, in one way the bread and butter of the type of projects that the bank has been financing over the last 20 years. Um, not going into detail here, but just to highlight that uh, we have a significant uh, uh, amount of investments in the energy sector, and this has been increasing in particular in the last five years with the prioritization of energy. Um, um, and we're also seeing, um, although not at the pace that we would like to see, but there is a, an increasing share uh, of private sector investment um, uh, of the African Development Bank um, uh, in the energy sector. Um, just to quickly highlight that in terms of the type of projects that we've been financing, there has been a, a very significant shift, uh, obviously, uh, between the first decade and the second decade um, 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 towards renewables. Uh, we have um, had only under 10% uh, in the first decade to, to well over 70% in the last decade and uh, even over 80% since the adoption of our New Deal Energy for Africa strategy. And we definitely see this, 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 this tendency uh, continue going forward. Um, just to, to highlight that we obviously, uh, as African Development Bank, offer um, a variety of instruments, uh, lending instruments, uh, risk management products are guarantee instruments, but also uh, ability to provide equity and, um, and, um, and, and, and other instruments, um, uh, including technical assistance and policy advisory work. Uh, I would just like to highlight um, with one slide um, our Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa, um, which has been working over the last couple of years uh, in terms of preparing renewable energy projects, providing project preparation funding for the private sector, but also working with governments in terms of uh, strengthening the policy, legal regulatory environment and developing um, um, structured approaches to renewables, for example, helping with IPP procurement. We've scaled CEFA up at the end of 2019 into a larger facility. It's now a blended finance facility. Um, able not only to provide uh, technical assistance, um, but also to provide concessional financing, um, uh, concessional finance instruments, taking um, a junior equity position in, in a new fund. For example, last year we were able to provide critical support to the first fund focusing on clean cooking, um, uh, the Spark Plus Fund, but also the Africa Renewable Energy Fund 2, which is actually managed uh, by Berkeley Energy out of Nairobi. Um, and we are focusing on three key thematic areas since the restructuring. Uh, we have, um, have already had before, but now an even stronger focus on uh, mini grids. Um, we have a new focus area that we coined Green Base Load. This is really to uh, provide um, support in terms of um, looking at the best um, um, uh, solutions uh, in terms of combining different renewable energy technologies in terms of strengthening the networks to be able to integrate more variable renewables, um, uh, working with countries on alternatives, basically to fossil fuel based um, uh, base load generation options. And we have a third priority around energy efficiency. Um, just very quickly, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm running slightly over time, um, is um, the facility for energy inclusion. Uh, it's a 500 million commercial debt platform for small scale renewables um, operating through two funds, FAY on grid and FAY OGEF. Uh, both funds are operational. Uh, FAY OGEF um, um, 
has already approved several projects um, uh, in in um, the solar home system um, space, um, uh, supporting, uh, for example, B-Box uh, in, in Rwanda with local currency lending, uh, supporting um, Sun Culture with inventory financing uh, in Kenya, and just also very recently a first uh, investment uh, into a solution provider in um, Bena and Burkina Faso. Uh, but also Fay on grid, um, which is now available, is focusing on mini grids, uh, CNI, and small scale IP. Um, just as highlighted, uh, we have extensive work and extensive ongoing work in the mini grid space. Um, this is just a screenshot of our green mini grid help desk, uh, which has been providing support uh, uh, to well over 100 mini grid developers um, um, over the last um, couple of years. Uh, and just to highlight that we have approved just in December last year a larger successor program, the Africa Green Mini Grid Acceleration Program, uh, ARMAP. Uh, and under this program, we will be particularly focusing on structured um, uh, in-country um, acceleration programs, also in the form of tenders um, uh, that we think will be important to help also de-risk uh, investments in, in mini-grids. Um, we're investing a lot of private equity platforms, uh, but I'm not going into this. Just one last slide uh, to highlight um, a flagship initiative of the bank, which is really focusing on the solar potential uh, in the band of Sahel countries from Senegal in the west all the way to Eritrea and Djibouti in the east uh, with a particular initial focus on the so-called Sahel G5 countries um, which are obviously more in west, uh, central and, and northern Africa um, and we working there with a political mandate from the heads of state uh, really trying to have uh, an integrated approach um, focused on the five priority interventions mentioned below. We've been working with the countries on having the right planning uh, in place uh, with roadmaps that have been validated by the Sahel G5 countries. We've mobilized um, a large coalition of uh, technical and financial partners um, around uh, the identified priorities and priority projects uh, and really trying to, to uh, now achieve the scale that is required to turn this um, vision uh, into reality. Uh, just to highlight a strong focus also on utility transformation, um, obviously uh, an essential component uh, also to the energy transition story. Um, and um, of course, um, a policy dialogue, including through our African energy marketplace platform uh, is, is, is a critical dimension, um, having a particular tripartite dialogue between governments, uh, private sector uh, and, um, and development partner community. Let me stop here and uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Scroth. We really appreciated your insight on various strategies for accelerating renewable energy and available options for Africa. Just a reminder to our participants that if you do have any questions, please do channel them on the chat um, icon and uh, we'll endeavor to answer as many as we can. So ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I'd like to welcome to the floor our second panelist, um, Honorable Gaithan Nikayenzi. He is the chairperson for the Energy Regulators Association of East Africa, General Assembly, a rare supreme policy and decision-making organ. As the chairperson, he oversees energy policy and framework harmonization in the East Africa community countries. That is Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and Uganda. He is also the chair of the board of directors of Arene, where he has been instrumental in the national regulatory institution's full operalization. Engineer Nikayenzi is a qualified engineer in electromechanical engineering from the University of Burundi and has published widely. His other degrees include civil engineering and general humanities from the same university. He has also attended numerous courses and conferences in many countries such as China, Egypt, India and Ethiopia. Previously, he was a director in charge of statistics and energy balances and advisor to the cabinet minister in charge of Burundi's energy. Engineer Nikayanzi has extensive knowledge in energy policy formulation, negotiation, evaluation of hydroelectric projects, project management, and electricity markets. He serves in several steering oversight committees and commissions in matters related to energy in Burundi. 
Under his leadership, the area was able to establish and operationalize a permanent secretariat in Tanzania, Arusha. He is a thoughtful leader, cut courageous and diplomatic in his engagement with area member countries' leadership. Welcome and over to you, Honorable Gethan Nikayenzi, and looking forward to hear what you have to say on how investments in renewable energy can support post-COVID-19 economic recovery in Africa. Thank you. Uh, I am Gaetan Chayenzi, already said, and I am the chairperson uh, for ERC General Assembly. Uh, my topic is how to invest, how investment in renewable energy can support post COVID 19 economic recovery in Africa. Uh, I have the table of content, and uh, I will introduce, and secondly, I will show the, type, the types of renewable energy uh, in Africa and uh, said that you will show the different sources of investment to improve the economic sector in Africa. And uh, fourth, I will conclude. Uh, by introduction, Africa has many assets to consider a dynamic or, of sustainable economy development because renewable energy can become the key to the major development of the African economy in the years to come after COVID-19. The question here is to, pull, is to be posed here is the, is the role, the surety role that renewable energy could play in order, in order, to, be, uh, in order to become a vector of the economic and the social takes of, of Africa because of its enormous and tap the potential. They amount, on the one hand, to electrifying the rural population above or with the off-grid, and on the other hand, the supporting sector dynamics. Uh, I can show the types of renewable energy in Africa, uh, and in addition to sunshine, the territory has immense potential for several types of renewable energy, including hydraulic. For example, Nile, Zambes, or Congo rivers, etc. Then biomass from the primary forests of Central Africa and the bagasse from sugarcane plantations. Geothermal energy in the Rift Valley and wind power on the coast and the Iceland. The promotion of off-grid technologies consisting of a small high electricity electricity production system, coupled with short range distribution system and the storage batteries will serve better for most of solar home systems, power between one and five homes, while the, large, the larger ones can power a village of a thousand homes. Their establishment requires a favorable natural environment environment and an initial investment capacity and the payment of consumption of the spot. The implementation of energy infrastructure development as an economic prospect in Africa will undoubtedly mean that the sector presents strong positive externalities in terms of economic development and the job creation. Hydraulic infrastructures and, and other investments in renewable energy by the possibility of making externalities in terms of development and the regional cooperation. In addition to the environmental and social impacts created by those major projects, they help improve the energy security of a regional whole. The, my, my part number three is about sources of investment in order to improve the economic sector in Africa. Before to invest, you have to, to know the main barriers to invest in renewable energy. Significant business opportunities, opportunities will result from the short-term potential of renewable energy and the new related industries, 
investors, venture capitalists, and independent power producers may be unaware of the renewable energy option available. Medium and long-term energy planning will require renewable formation. Related to the development of solar and wind energy projects. And the, the main barriers to invest in renewable energy are techni technological. Most renewable energy options, such as, such as solar and the wind, are unstable. That is, the energy supply is controlled by climate and the meteorology, and thus, Plus the same unstable characteristics. The technical challenge here is for the development of the new storage and the energy distribution system processes to minimize the instability of energy supply. Secondary, price. The price for most renewable energies, for instance, solar and the wind, are often not competitive in the energy market. The, 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 C is, the third is the information. And the, the information, I can say, the lack of reliable assessment of in the countries, renewable energy resource potential. The lack, the lack of long time series of ground data. And the C, I can say, the limited knowledge of the viability and the confidence level linked to several natural and non-natural non -natural variables such as climate, topography, and the man-made impact in the environment. Then the, the need for a geographically integrated database. Sorry. The key question is how to generate or dispose of such large investment to meet growing financing needs as the African economy largest affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, the difficult situation should stimulate an increased interest in innovation and funding to help provide, for example, more and better aid. Two main, main categories of finance mechanisms, new resource and the mechanism to catalyze private, private investment. The idea here is not to push for a single mechanism, but to encourage the development of multiple options based on global, regional, bilateral, national, and local initiatives. Now I want to, I go to, to talk about the financing on the renewable energy sector. The, the presentation here is a work that we aim to provide without being exhaustive, an overview of certain sources of the main finding which can be applied to finance renewable energy initiatives, and especially after the pandemic COVID-19, and that they will be nine. The first one A is to, to, to stimulate private capital flows. Private capital is a huge source of wealth. It's true that due to the a variety of factors, many opportunities in Africa countries are often perceived as too risky or uncertain for the majority of investors. B is the social impact bond, SIB. It's a new form of multi, multi stakeholder partnership designed to mobilize private capital for scaling up solutions to economic problems by installing, installing energy infrastructure for the use of renewable energies could also be a social impact bond. The C are the guarantees. Some investment result in adequate risk adjust, adjusted returns for investors or governments and the fire to attract capital through debt on terms that could ensure the feasibility project. Guarantees help to mitigate or manage the financial requirements 
that investors are not necessarily willing to take. In such cases, it is possible to make equity investments, which, which directly inject the capital to grow with the operation of project, or a firm and allow it to leverage further resources as they mitigate the risk for other investors. E is a consultation. Uh, I can say in addition to subsidizing these cost of loans, guarantees or equity investment, concessional resources can also be used uh, as a risk buffer to cover first lose, losses in the waterfall payment mechanism that assign the payment of the H is about the public private partnerships. You can have this, I can map or picture, and they, they are many relationships about all partners. And I can say that, that the PPP is compasses the sun's team, reward or subsidiary. In several terms, RBF refers to the mechanism in which funding bodies, bond bodies make payment only after previously agreed outcomes of the production was carried out. I, I, and then I can conclude. Uh, the global COVID-19 pandemic has exposed additional vulnerabilities in electricity sector. The investments in distribution and renewable generation are necessary to enhance the sustainability and the financial viability of the power sector in Africa. Invest, investing in renewable energy has the potential to create new and innovative jobs for African, especially for women. The investment needs to scale up. Renewable energy cannot be fully financed by the public sector. A greater use of IPP model and the distributed generation can help mobilize private capital. Okay, if there is uh, any question, any clarification or experience to share, they are all welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We've really appreciated that. Um, I'll request all participants, um, the questions will be made or channeled at the chat forum so that we could be able to stick to the program and then we'd be able to answer them then. However, we'll still have a Q&A session after we've concluded all the presentations. So thank you so very much, Honorable Gaithan Nikai Kienzi. We thank you for all the strategies and um, insight that you've given to us on various investment strategies in renewable energy that can help Africa accelerate post COVID-19 economic uh, recovery in Africa. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, at this juncture, I'd like to welcome to the floor our third panelist, Engineer Murefu Barasa. He is currently the Chief Executive Officer of EED Advisory Limited. He is an experienced business and development consultant with a focus on advancing energy access in Africa. Over the last 16 years, Murefu has led engagements for several clients, including the World Bank Group, UN Agency, UK De Department of International Development, private entities, research institutions, the GOK Government of Kenya, Government of Tanzania, amongst others. He has contributed to various projects across several countries, um, including in East Africa, uh, Tunisia, Ghana, Brazil, and the US. He previously worked for Practical Action Nairobi, Camco Clean Energy PLC Nairobi, and the African Development Bank in Tunis. Engineer Murefu holds a BSc in Environmental Studies from Kenyatta University, Kenya, and a Master's in Environmental Sciences from Yale University. He is a compot, com, compot. You know that one of the most frustrating sectors has been in the cooking sector. So the way we Africans cook today is uh, practically the same way 
we've been cooking 50, uh, 50 years ago. If you look at uh, the percentage uh, households that have access to clean cooking solutions, the number is just uh, 15%, according to the SDG7 tracker. Um, and if you zoom into rural areas, the number drops to 4%. So it's been a very difficult uh, sector to change and to transform for various reasons. Um, but there's been some, some progress over the last few years, although there's still a lot to be done. So one of the strategic innovations that I would like to highlight, which has been very interesting to me personally, and also to the organization that I work for, which is EED, uh, EED Advisory, is the issue of electric uh, cooking. So these are still the very early days of electric cooking. And uh, one program that I'd like to highlight is the Modern Energy Cooking Services uh, a, a program that's supported by uh, FCDO and done together with the University of Loughborough, uh, as well as the Clean Cooking Alliance and a host of other partners. So one of the innovations has been the distribution or testing of uh, electric uh, pressure cookers. So in a study that was done in Nairobi recently, as you can see on the graph, the cost of uh, cooking uh, half a kilo of yellow beans compared across several cooking solutions, charcoal, kerosene, LPG, a hot plate, you find that the electric pressure cooker, in spite of the very high cost of electricity in Kenya, was still quite competitive. So, because for example, supply looks like this, and then you have the hydro, geothermal, and also to a great extent biomass, the supply looks like this. So it's a steady, it's, it's a steady curve. So again, that's the other thing. When we're talking about renewable energy, we also have to ask ourselves, what are we really saying? We're talking about variable renewable energy or dispatchable renewable energy. So now in this narrative of Africa leapfrogging into uh, renewable energy future, this is possible in, in several countries. I, I, when I, when I think, think about it, I see countries like Kenya with geothermal and hydro, countries like Ethiopia, even Tanzania with the 1,200 Stigla Gorge, obviously countries like DRC with immense supply of hydropower, these countries can very easily leapfrog into renewable energy. But if you look at countries like Nigeria, countries like Senegal, Benin, that do not have uh, sufficient or dependable hydro resources or geothermal resources, then they are left with only variable renewable energy. And this is why the place of battery storage comes in. So in a traditional grid, which is, does not uh, incorporate high levels of renewable energy, is what you'll see on your left. So that's A. It's just generation, transmission, distribution. It's not a big deal. But when you get into a, high, into a variable renewable energy where you have high shares, anything above 25% or 30%, then you start getting challenges of integration. And this is not just in Africa, because even in, even in Europe, countries like Denmark, beyond 50%, they start struggling with integrating high levels of variable renewable energy. But with batteries, uh, battery technology, I think it holds a lot of promise for Africa because our current generation capacity is very low, just like uh, Daniel illustrated in his initial slides, access rates are low, uh, the quality of electricity is low. So as we are building out our system, we have the opportunity to avoid some of the, uh, the investments that were made in the West because obviously by those, during those days, you do not have battery energy storage. So you see that uh, in the recent past, for example, Australia in, in the North South Wales, they've announced a project with a battery energy uh, power capacity of 1.2 megawatts. That's a huge, huge battery. In fact, most of the African, half, half of the Sub-Saharan African countries don't even have a total installed capacity of 1.2 gigawatts. That's already a, a signaling in the market that there's a great potential in African uh, countries uh, uh, integrating battery storage. It's still very early days because the batteries have not been tested at scale. Uh, the technology is interesting and promising. Therefore, there needs to be some caution in how uh, Africa moves into integrating batteries with variable renewable energy. In South Africa, for example, there's a, there's a pilot project, uh, 80 megawatts, uh, not 80 megawatts, yeah, 80, 
yeah, 80 megawatts of uh, battery capacity, about 320 megawatt hours, just to test uh, the system's capability to integrate these uh, new resources. And as you can see, the price of batteries is dropping quite fast. Of course, this is driven in part by uh, the rise in electric vehicles um, and also other, other forces. So lithium ion batteries are really coming down. So this is definitely an area that African countries should look at. But bear in mind that uh, the conversation of leapfrogging is not as simple as uh, many people put it across. There are very many uh, factors to, to consider. Then the third uh, technological and uh, say strategic innovation that I'd like to highlight, and this has also been mentioned by the previous speaker, so I'll not dwell, dwell too much on this, is the need for power interconnection and the rise in power interconnection. So of course, we already have the West Africa Power Pool, the Central Africa Power Pool, East Africa, South, Southern Africa, and the Comelec, and these are already working. However, many of them are not power pools in the conventional sense. Uh, so for example, like in Europe, you have a power pool with spot pricing uh, and very innovative uh, trade and finance instruments. You do not have that uh, in Africa, apart from to some extent in the South Africa power pool, which was uh, put together, of course, with, uh, with the support of the, the, the Nordic uh, uh, government. And a lot of it, a lot of the design was, uh, was built from the European experience. So it's, it's quite advanced compared to the, the other uh, power pools. But in the East Africa power pool, for example, it's, it's not really a power pool in that sense. It's, it's just an interconnection of countries, which is still a very big step forward uh, in my view. And this should be encouraged even more. The truth of the matter though, is that Africa's uh, power pool need not, because I've, I've seen, for example, discussions of uh, connecting the, all these power pools together and creating something like what's happening in Europe. I think that may not be practical because one, the African continent is huge geographically. So just the upper part is, is bigger than uh, Europe. So in terms of uh, the energy demand density and the need to, uh, you know, transmit power over thousands and thousands of kilometers pushes the system towards more localized power pools. So the East Africa power pool perhaps is best place to focus on advancing it and also maybe connecting to South Africa power pool because of the, of the distance. But then to say uh, you want to connect uh, Senegal all the way to South Africa, then you start running into some inefficiencies uh, there, technical inefficiencies. So the map on, 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 your, on, your, on your left, and perhaps this is where I should have started, just shows the high potential of these countries to generate clean energy. So for example, Ethiopia, you can see one gigawatt of geothermal, Kenya is up to 10 gigawatts of geothermal, and you can see very many African countries with high potential for hydro, with DRC, just the Grand Inga alone with the potential of 40 gigawatts. So again, if we're thinking of a renewable energy powered future, Interconnection is, is at the heart of this conversation. And I know, for example, uh, uh, the, the, the regional economic uh, communities are looking at this uh, keenly, but I thought also that I should highlight this as one of the three uh, strategic innovations, both at the technological and also at the policy level that could power the future of Africa. Others, as I close, uh, others to think about are electric vehicles. And of course the electric vehicles is an inevitable change. So the ground has shifted. Uh, the world is moving from internal combustion engine. When we shall get to a place where there are more electric vehicles than internal combustion engine is up for debate. But the truth of the matter is that the ground has shifted. And African countries by and large import their vehicles, say from uh, Japan and other, uh, uh, other countries. And as those countries move to electric vehicles, it's inevitable Then we also have to move. The others are decentralized and, uh, energy solutions. And if I had more time, I'd also talk about energy efficiency. I want to stop there in the interest of time and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Murefu. Uh, we've gotten a lot of insight on um, a possible renewable energy powered future um, and also the paradox of the whole discussion going around about um, Africa um, going 100% renewable energy and the various um, dimensions and also more 
key is the importance of very bespoke solutions for Africa. Um, yes, we could learn from the West, but having very um, specially, um, is it um, needed solutions vis-a-vis -vis energy for Africa. So thank you about that. Um, before um, we close with you, um, Engineer Murefu, um, I have one question I'd like to pose from you, from one of our um, participants. Um, comment is from Mr. Leo Kombi. It says that the increased uptake of renewable energy, especially variable uh, renewable energy technologies such as wind and solar has resulted in grid stability challenges occasioned by the intermittent nature of these technologies. In some cases, this has led to increased use of thermal sources to stabilize the grid and utilize incurring extra costs in terms of auxiliary services, which um, just bear with me as I get it. Yes, um, so in some cases, this has led to increased use of thermal sources to stabilize the grid and utilities incurring extra costs in terms of auxiliary services, which are not sustainable for some utilities. What are the current efforts towards mitigating these challenges to ensure uptake of renewable energy technologies? What's your take, Engineer Murefu? Uh, thanks, Adida, and uh, thanks, Lee, for the... The, the, the very important question as we discuss this transition to a renewable energy future. So a good example is actually Kenya, which hosts the largest uh, wind uh, power plant on the continent, the 300 megawatts Electrucana uh, uh, wind project. Um, the integration of Electrucana wind uh, into the Kenyan system has uh, brought unprecedented uh, challenges, but also great opportunity. So to answer uh, Lee's question more directly, some of the measures to be taken are not even uh, technological as it were. So some of the measures include uh, proper planning, so proper uh, electricity sector planning. I, I have looked at uh, some of the uh, electricity master plans uh, across some African countries, and I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about the high level of commitment to invest in variable renewable energy without the necessary infrastructure to support this. Even in Europe and even in California, where recently they had serious pro problems with uh, energy supply, it has taken them very many years to integrate variable renewable energy. So there needs to be some caution in one, planning to ensure that we learn as we build uh, and not just take uh, any technology wholesale because it may have some impact on the stability and then it kind of defeats uh, the purpose that was set out. The other one, like I mentioned, is battery energy storage. The other one is interconnection because if you have like Trucana wind blowing and Kenya, for example, does not have capacity to absorb, then you can divert this, say, to Rwanda. So the interconnection, uh, proper planning and battery energy storage will be some of the measures to address uh, variability. Many thanks, and um, I was very, very pleased to hear you talk about electric, um, is it mobility and electric cars? So, um, I mean, for example, I think Kenya last year, we do have, is it a national policy in the make? So there are uh, steps towards going that way. So very pleased to announce that. So thank you very much, engineer. Um, thank you for your time. Um, any other questions, please, to the participants, you could pose them on the chat channel and we'd be pleased to progress. Um, ladies and gentlemen, again, um, thank you for um, going through along with us and I'd like to welcome to the floor our fourth panelist who is Dr. Victoria Nalule. She currently is the Executive Director of the Africa Energy and Minerals Management Initiative, IME. Dr. Nalule, just to give you a short bio about her, is an energy and mining professional and consultant with extensive experience working on various projects in the different parts of the globe. She is a holder of a PhD in international energy law and policy from the University of Dundee. Victoria also is a founder and executive director of the African Energy and Minerals Management Initiative. She is currently involved as a research fellow with the DFI Day funded Extractives Hub project based in the University of Dundee, UK. She is also the lead consultant and CEO of the NEM Energy Consultancy. Dr. Victoria is an author and has widely published on topics related to oil, gas, 
Renewable Energy, Climate Change, and Mining in Africa. Her latest four books being Mining and the Law in Africa, Exploring the Social and Environmental Impacts, Energy Transitions and the Future of the African Energy Sector, Law, Policy and Governance, and another book on energy, poverty and access challenge in Sub-Saharan Africa, The Role of Regionalism. She also has a book with heart publishers focused on land law and extractives. Dr. Nalule has advised African governments on oil, gas and mining projects, including appearing as an expert witness before the Commission of Inquiry into Land Matters in Uganda, presenting comments on the South African Petroleum Bill before the country's policymakers, leading a team of energy experts in reviewing energy and mining laws and policies for countries such as Namibia, Ethiopia, Uganda, amongst others. Dr. Nalule today will be discussing with us on the role of women leadership in clean energy innovation and transition. Welcome and over to you, Dr. Nalule. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I had mentioned that I would not be sharing slides, but however, I would like to share my slides. I don't know if I have permission to do that. Please proceed, Dr. Nalule. You may proceed to share your screen. Okay, just a minute. All right, so as I'm sharing my slides, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, as I've been introduced, I'm um, Victoria Nalle. I'm from Uganda, but I'm currently based at the University of Dundee, where I'm working on a DFID project focused on uh, reaching out to various countries, African countries, with respect to the management of the energy and mining sectors. So, It's really funny because I always use Zoom for all my webinars, but right now it has acted so funny. But anyway, uh, let me just go ahead and share my presentation, which is not sharing. But I want to focus on the issue of the role of law and policy with respect to transitioning to a low carbon economy. So basically, I know when we, when we're talking about gender justice, we are all focused on ensuring that women are well represented in the energy sector, whereby women have access to all the benefits that accrue in the energy sector, not only energy, but also mining. But I want to style my presentation in a way that we look at gender justice, but from a legal and policy analysis. And the reason is because I'm a holder of a PhD in energy law, I'm also a lawyer. And uh, through the name consultancy, we've done a lot of work with respect to reviewing various laws for different African countries, including Namibia, Rwanda, we're working on the methane gas policy, Uganda, we reviewed the climate change bill, uh, South Africa, and also the regional laws like uh, the laws of Iswati. So through these laws, you notice that most of the challenges we're facing as a region or as African countries with respect to the decarbonization of the energy sector, they basically relate to the unfavorable laws and also the unfavorable policies. So basically the political environment, the, the investment environment that is needed to ensure that we transition to a low carbon economy. Um, from a region perspective, because I know it, um, I'm an author of several books, including a book on energy poverty and access challenges in sub-Saharan Africa, which looks at the role of regionalism. And here I look at the harmonization of the different energy and mining laws in different African countries. So from a regional perspective, you notice that as African countries, we face common challenges with respect to energy access, which is goal seven of the SDGs. We face common challenges with respect to tackling climate change, which is SDG 13. And also taking into consideration the 2015 Paris Agreement, you notice that we are looking at these challenges at a global level. But the question is, how can we have tailored solutions for the unique challenges we face as a region? Because, um, for instance, countries in East Africa, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, they face common 
energy challenges. Countries in West Africa, they face common energy challenges. But when you look at these challenges from a legal perspective, legal and perspective, you notice that we don't have harmonized laws and that is a challenge that we're really facing. And I think I'm not one of the speakers mentioned uh, their experience with respect to harmonization of laws and policies. So moving forward, how is the issue of law and policy affecting us in, achi in achieving all our targets with respect to decarbonization? First and foremost, uh, from my experience, because uh, I've done field work, field work research besides the desktop research, besides reviewing laws and policies, I've done field work research. And at the moment, we're focusing on energy transitions, which is definitely understandable but we tend to miss out on some of the key issues that are happening on the ground. I'll give the experience of some of the fields I visited where renewable energy was being, um, uh, where actually they were installing various solar panels. And one of the payment methods that the company was using, this was in, in Arusha, actually. In Arusha, yes, I was in Tanzania during my PhD research was the payment method of paying in installments because when we're talking about energy access we have to agree we have to note the geographies of energy transition and by geographies you move from looking at developed countries and developing countries and then you move to looking at the regions in a country urban areas and rural areas the challenges they face are different and also with respect to issues of uh, finance so we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about reliability, we're talking about affordability. So on the issue of affordability, this is the example I want to give from my field work research. Uh, this big solar company was operating in Tanzania. A top person in East Africa, actually, I will not mention names here. And they had a payment method where the poor people in rural areas could pay in installments to get the solar panels installed in their homes but when they failed to pay all the money at once then the company would come and take back the solar equipment so what issue am i talking about here besides the issue of affordability we are also looking at policy issues are we as african countries ready for this transition besides the um, international instruments we're looking at, the regional instruments we're looking at, and the national instruments we're looking at. Are our laws really taking care of these key challenges where uh, when we, are, we tend to ignore with respect to energy transitions? Because that's one issue now of, of affordability, but also the issue of reliability. Because if at the end of the day, companies will take back the equipment when the poor families haven't paid in full, then what exactly are we solving? So that's one issue because in my presentation, I just want to look at the practical issues because everything has been discussed. We now appreciate the issue of decarbonization, energy transitions, but I want to highlight some of the key issues we tend to miss out. Then the other issue is, uh, I haven't had uh, most presenters talk about the role of critical minerals in the energy transition. And with respect to critical minerals, I would like to focus my discussion on uh, energy access for Atsan and small scale miners. How are we handling this, the nexus between energy and mining? Because now we agree we need electric vehicles, the, all the solar panels and wind, wind turbines, they need uh, material that are basically good from the critical minerals. So the mining sector is increasingly becoming important with respect to uh, transitioning to a low carbon economy globally. But on the African continent, when you look at the mining sector, you look at the issue of Atsan and Moscow mining. How are these people uh, mining these minerals? The DRC Congo, it's a home to enormous mineral resources, including cobalt, which is part of the critical minerals. There are many at and small scale miners in those, in those countries, because I note the focus for this discussion is innovations in the renewable energy sector. So how are we getting these innovations we're talking about and directing them 
to this large number of artisans, Moscow miners, who are actually um, who are actually doing most of the work, because we cannot have a just transition to a low carbon economy if the minerals we need are being got from people who are who are relying on rudimentary methods to mine. That is artisans, Moscow mining. Now I will move on to my focus of the discussion, which is gender justice with respect to uh, the energy sector or even a transition to a low carbon economy. Gender justice is a very important issue or gender equality is a very important issue. And although internationally we've recognized the challenges women face and how we can solve some of those challenges, some scholars, including myself, because I, I think I forgot to mention, I have five books, five published books, focused on energy and mining in Africa. So if you need any research on that, that's my Victoria Nolley, five published books, and I have three more coming on top of book chapters and various journal articles and research insights. So looking at the research with respect to gender justice, which we can agree that the issue of energy access is gendered in nature. Why? Women are the main users of energy resources because of the domestic work of women, including cooking. When, when we go to rural areas, you see it's mostly women who will be uh, involved in fetching firewood, cooking, all the domestic work, it's done by women. And if we are looking at the issue of energy access, uh, we have to focus on improved cook stops for these women. And Obviously, there have been various innovations and initiatives for cook stops in different countries, but how effective are they? Because one of the problems with respect to uh, domestic work done by women is the indoor air pollution that is caused by over-reliance on traditional biomass or traditional energy, including charcoal firewood. So that indoor air pollution, how are we eliminating it entirely? from these cold stoves and other innovative cooking facilities we are deploying to tackle the challenge of energy access. So with gender justice, if we are to tackle gender inequalities in the energy sector, first, we have to understand the energy sector entirely. And however much we're talking about transitioning to a local urban economy or renewable energy, we also have to pay extra attention to some of the role of fossil fuels in financing the renewable energy projects. Now, having thrown in the role of fossil fuels in the energy sector or in transitioning to a low carbon economy through the finances that can be good from fossil fuels to finance the projects, we look at how women are represented in all aspects of the energy sector, be it fossil fuels or renewables. In negotiations, how many women do we see who take part in these negotiations? Uh, on a, at a professional level, I think women are taking up places, so I don't think I would really complain. But at, uh, at the unprofessional level, if we are to really look at 90% of the women who are in rural areas, then that is where our focus should be. How are we involving them? How are they benefiting from the innovations in the renewable energy sector, from the innovations in the energy sector? How are they benefiting financially in terms of fossil fuels for countries that definitely have the fossil fuels? Because we cannot discuss the energy sector by only concentrating on one aspect of the energy sector. We have to be open and take into consideration the fact that most of these countries with the increased um, urbanization we're anticipating, industrialization we're anticipating, then you notice that all types, of all types of energy, including fossil fuels and renewables, will play a major role. So with energy justice, we ask ourselves, how are women being represented in the development and management of these energy resources? Now, moving forward, I want to draw your attention to the nexus between SDG 7 and the achievement of all the other SDGs. And obviously this brings in the entire discussion on gender justice. SDG 7 is goal, SDG 7 is energy access. 
but you notice that we cannot achieve all the other SDGs, including health living, including gender equality, including uh, quality education, without achieving SDG 7 on energy access. So when we're talking about the innovations in the energy sector, we also have to link these innovations to the various sectors that are being affected or influenced by SDG 7, that is energy access. For instance, in schools, we will notice that most schools in rural areas and some developing countries, they don't have access to electricity. So how will they use computers if they don't have access to electricity? And how will they ensure quality education? And then the question for policymakers and other innovators or private sector, and even the African Development Bank at this stage would be, how are we going to focus on getting the innovations to bring in the, to bridge the gap between energy access and access to quality education. Now we are, we are in this period of the, pandem the pandemic of COVID-19, which has really stressed the major importance of the health sector, but we also not without access to energy, modern energy, then how will the hospitals in rural Africa operate if the machines are not going to be operating because they lack access to electricity. And the question for policymakers and the developmental partners at this stage and also the private sector is what kind of innovations can bridge the gap between energy access and health living? So my discussion is really to raise questions because I've gone through policy, I've done Field work research, I've gone through laws, I've gone through the bills, and I notice most of the mistakes we make when we're enacting these laws. We tend sometimes to copy and paste what other countries have done. We tend to forget the unique challenges countries are facing. We tend to forget the developments that have occurred recently. And without really focusing our laws and policies to the critical challenges we face right now and the critical solutions we need, then we're going to keep discussing the issue of energy access for a very long time because you need the policies to drive the decision. You need the laws to make sure that everything that is being done is legal. And recently, I think for people who follow me, I've been reviewing the various energy laws, the provisions, including stabilization clauses. How are they affecting countries? How are they affecting investors? So when we're discussing about innovations in the renewable energy sector, when we're discussing about the ways to tackle energy, uh, gender injustices in the energy sector, when we're talking about energy justice, when we're talking about um, a just transition to a low carbon economy, when we're thinking about climate justice, we need to really place our laws in a way that they are up to date and they are practical enough to address the challenges we are facing. Uh, I'll be sharing my slides with the organizers so that you can get a copy of the slides. But basically, uh, the focus for me or the questions I would like to pose, because I like to pose provocative questions, is are we ready to even transition to a local urban economy? And the, the answer to that is yes, most countries are ready, they are already laws. But then how practical is it? What are those minor things we are missing out or we are overlooking because we think they're not important and yet in most cases, these are the issues that we should pay extra attention to. So in my concluding remarks, I would note the need to find ways of bridging the gap between SDG 7 and other SDGs. And as we're talking about technology innovations, then that means whenever we are implementing or developing some kind of technology or innovation, we should have it at the back of our minds. Okay, if we, are, if we bring in this innovation, let's say improved cook stoves, how are they going to help the people in rural areas, the women who are mostly relying on cook stoves to cook? And then when we're talking about the health sector in Africa, what are the key challenges with respect to the health sector? How are we going to use the energy sector and the innovations in the energy sector to tackle some of those challenges? Because as energy experts and as experts in the mining sector, we should always try to 
find ways of linking our ideas, our innovations, and all whatever whatever support or um, research we have in resolving the various challenges communities are facing due to lack of access to modern energy. So in closing, I would draw your attention to my five books. I can always give you free soft copies, which really, um, they analyze the key issues with respect to the energy sector. And also you can uh, visit our website of the Naruli Energy and Mining Consultancy. We have short research insights because we know most people are busy. They're not going to read general articles. They're not going to read books. So we do the research insights in a way that you will get the key issues that you really need to take into consideration when you're solving some of these energy and mining challenges. So thank you very much. And uh, this was a short presentation because I think we are already running out of time. Thank you very much. Dr. Victoria Nalule, um, what a joy to hear about your insights, more so about how um, the other SDGs cannot be, you know, reached without ensuring um, SDC, SDG 7 is, um, you know, um, actualized, which is to ensure accessible, uh, reliable and sustainable and modern, modern energy for all. Um, we found this very insightful and um, we're really pleased with your take. So um, to all the participants, um, I think we've tried to answer most of your questions on the chat. If you do have any question at this point, please still channel it to our latter so that we could answer before our distinguished uh, panelists um, close. Um, as we close, I'd like to close by stating that renewable energy is a clear winner when it comes to boosting the economy and creating jobs. You can't be a first world economy in the 21st century if you're not on the path to a clean energy future. And on the foregoing, area is moving with speed towards an East Africa energy union and ultimately um, an, an African energy union through the steady harmonization of energy policy, sustainable capacity building and information sharing within the region and ultimately Africa and the world. We thank all our eminent panelists, Dr. Rabia Feruki, um, Dr. Daniel Scroth, Honorable Gethan Nikayenzi, Engineer Murufu Baraza and Dr. Victoria Nalule. We thank the Executive Secretary Erea for organizing this webinar. We want to thank the members of the NRIs to NRIA and finally thank all the distinguished participants for the invaluable contribution to the webinar. We'd like to close as well by thanking all the individuals without whom this webinar would not have been a success. Um, um, all the individuals who've contributed from the NRIs, um, truly thank you. So at this juncture, um, or without further ado, we would like to call this webinar to close. Thank you.